Good morning and thank you so much for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about the theme of Easter is not pagan and it's extremely relevant because at this time of the year we see it in social media, we hear it that Easter itself is under tremendous attack and we need to stand firm in our faith. And some of the attacks is going about the dates of Easter is incorrect, the symbols of Easter are pagan and um, you know, even if Easter wasn't pagan, we have no instruction to, to celebrate it. So I disagree. I say that Easter is not pagan. And this morning's message is a bit technical, but please do stay with me. It'll be worth it. A scripture reading is a couple here. It's Acts 12 verse 4, and then John 19 verse 4 to 7 verse 30 chapter 20 and verse 16, and it has usual all from the New International Version. So starting with Acts 12, verse 4, it reads, After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Moving to John. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crowns of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Chapter 20, verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now it's true that every year, followers of some religious leaders undertake a pilgrimage to the remains of their leader, their prophet or their God. Have you ever realized that us as Christians can't do that? There are no remains. The tomb is empty. Jesus is resurrected and is ascended to heaven. In fact, Robert Butler wrote, The only hope we have in this life stems from what God did for us. He came for you. He suffered for you. He died for you. He rose for you. And because he died for us, because he died for you and for me, the consequences of our sins have been dealt with. Because he lives we live. This is the good news. Christ's death and resurrection are critical doctrines of the Christian faith. They, they, they're important teachings. So much so that 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17 reads, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In other words, without Christ's death and resurrection, Christianity in essence is no different to any other religion because we serve a loving and living God. So since his death and resurrection are true, all who have received God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ, therefore, have reason to celebrate. Now let's work with this theme. Biblically, you go into the Old Testament, God instructs his children to feast and celebrate what he has done for his people. And the most prominent Old Testament festival related to the celebration of Easter is Passover. In fact, although the Bible not, might not specifically state celebrate Easter, it doesn't forbid it either. There is therefore nothing out of the ordinary to celebrate what God has done for his people through Jesus Christ. So let's go back now to Acts 12 verse 4. And let's read from the King James translation this time, because it's a little different to the NIV. It reads, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter 
to bring him forth to the people. Now, I find it both interesting and comforting that the translators of the King James Version of the Bible were convinced that Easter was a Christian holiday, so much so that they used the word Easter with other translations used the word Passover. And to me, it is unimaginable that these translators would deliberately use in Acts 12 verse 4 the word Easter in reference to anything pagan. Now, at this stage, I must say that other translations, as well as the King James Version, is correct. But let me explain why the King James Version used the word Easter. And we go and we compare John 2 verse 13 and John 11 verse 55, and we see in both of them, John is specifically referring to the Jews' Passover. Not just to Passover, but the Jews' Passover. Now, the book of John was written between 90 and 100 AD, well after the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection. So, in a sense, he was looking back and he said, the Jews passed over. And it would make very little sense for John to specifically state the Jews passed over if the Jews' Passover was the only Passover. On the other hand, it makes a lot of sense if there was more than one Passover, which brings us to the word, use of the word Easter in Acts 12 verse 4. Eusebius, a bishop and the historian of Christianity, wrote the following, For the parishes of all Asia, as from an older tradition held at the 14th day of the moon on which Jesus was commanded to sacrifice the lamb, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. If you, want to, you can go read about that in the book's church history, book 5, 23, 1. But the point is, the literal translation there reads, Savior's Pascha. It appears from Eusebius' writings, other writings of the church fathers, and the King James translation of Acts 12 verse 4, that early Christians were celebrating a Savior's Passover, the celebration of the resurrection of the Savior, which is what we know today as the Christian celebration of Easter. So we can say for Luke, who wrote Acts, Pascha at Acts 12 verse 4 meant Easter, a Savior's Passover, a shift in meaning from the traditional Jewish Passover which is what the King James translation is reflecting. Now, there are some queries and challenges on the exact timing of Easter, but we must understand that Jewish months are lunar. In other words, they're reflecting the phases of the moon. And the spring month of Nisan corresponds with March, April, thereabouts on our calendar. And we have no doubt that Passover, the crucifixion, and the resurrection happened between Nisan 14 and Nisan 22. Again, there are semantics. We can discuss that later. But for now, we need to understand that because of the close relationship between Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the whole week there was sometimes referred to as Passover, and it is still referred to you know, as a single celebration, even today. And this explains how the Jewish leaders had already eaten the Passover proper, but there were also other sacrifices to be made and meals to be eaten. So looking back in history, we find this as a probable timeline. The Thursday, Passover, Nisan 14. That's commanded by Scripture. Passover is on Nisan 14, even though it's on a Thursday. Friday, the day of preparation in which Jesus was crucified, the preparation is for the Sabbath on the Saturday, not for the Passover. That happened the day before. And the day of crucifixion, day one, according to how the Jews calculate their timing. Saturday, the weekly Sabbath, day two. Sunday, the resurrection, day three. So Easter has a date that corresponds with the Jewish Passover, but is not necessarily tied to its date. With this calculation, though, the date of Easter is a movable date that might fall between March the 22nd and April the 25th in our Gregorian calendar. We're not running on a lunar calendar anymore. So that brings us to the next challenge, and that is where they say that Ishtar, an ancient Mesopotamian goddess of war, fertility and sex, and 
all of this is somehow confused with Easter. And there's a connection between Ishtar and Easter. They even sound the same. And there was one thing circulating on social media that added, after Constantine decided to Christianize the empire, Easter was changed to represent Jesus, but at its root, Easter is all about celebrating fertility and sex. Wrong. It is true that Ishtar, a form of Astarte, and Easter might sound the same. But here's the thing. Sounding the same is not evidence that the words are related to one another. It merely means they sound the same. The word Astarte, if you look at its etymology, in other words, going back to its roots, you start finding descriptions such as increase or flock. And this is making sense to me because Ishtar and Astarte is a Semitic word related to animal fertility. Easter, however, is rooted in the German word. In other words, it's not Babylonian. Austin, as in the direction from which the sun rises. East as a word and a direction does not relate to animal fertility and therefore relating to Astarte or Ishtar. So while we're in this line, let's quickly zoom into the supposed Easter and Eoster link. Again, sounds the same. But this link is traced back to Bede, who lived from 672 to 735. And some scholars actually doubt that Bede would have actually known which came first, Eoster Monath or the goddess Eoster. Having said this, and I'm back in the translation here, you've got to be patient with me, and pronunciation as well, the point is twofold. Firstly, that at Bede's time, the tradition of the goddess Eoster had already been established, and it might have appeared to be that April was named after Eoster. Secondly, Eoster Monath comes from Ostar Manot, the old Germanic name for April. So if we look at the old Germanic calendar, it named the months after what characterized that month. So Oster Manot, meaning east or sunrise month. In other words, in that hemisphere when the sun was noticeably rising earlier in the mornings. So, so far we're in agreement that, you know, with the timing of nice and 14 to nice and 22, as we spoke earlier, things make sense. East is a descriptive word referred to dawn or sunrise, and we can now start to understand why pagans are using it for their goddess of sunrise, and they're called the Eoster. Similarly, Christians use the word for east in referring to a very special dawn. The Bible describes Christ's resurrection as being discovered in the morning, at dawn, or at the rising of the sun. So the fact that a Saxon goddess went by the name Eoster does not mean that Easter is a pagan word or Easter is a pagan festival. Let's think about this reasonably. Many of the words we use today have a pagan origin. Mars, for example, is the ancient Roman god of war, but we still call the planet Mars. Saturday is the day of Saturn, the ancient god of agriculture. Saturn Day became Saturday, but it doesn't stop us from using the word Saturday. The word might have originated in a pagan context, but think about it. We call the day after Tuesday Wednesday. That does not mean we're involved in paganism. It means the day before Thursday, the day after Tuesday, is called Wednesday. And that brings me to a final note about rabbits and eggs. Very different origins, and it's steeped in complex and often conflicting history, but we come back. The principle of a symbol relates to its current, not its historical meaning. Think about a swastika. Once a symbol of good, good fortune, we remember the Nazis by it. So the question at hand is, what do the symbols of the Easter bunny and Easter egg mean for us today? New life, perhaps? Perhaps when we crack that chocolate around the Easter egg, it can represent the seal around the tomb being broken? Think about it. But whatever your answer, remember that our focus is important. Is it on Jesus? Easter is a time to reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus and what this means for us today.
Easter is the time of the year when Jesus rose from the dead, and there's good grounds to celebrate it. Early Christians chose to celebrate the resurrection on a Sunday because the resurrection occurred on a Sunday at dawn. Christ's resurrection is a dawn and a spiritual sense because that is when the light of salvation resurrected Christ. He came out from the darkness of death. The God the Son died for our salvation and His resurrection is the guarantee that God the Father accepted the price paid by Jesus on the cross. And we need to get this message out. It's called evangelism. Amen. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you that there is such a thing as Easter. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross. We thank you that he rose again. We thank you, Lord, for your love, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. As we enter this time of Easter, bring to mind those things in our lives that need to change, that we can honor you with all of our being as we reflect over the work of Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.